Well, good evening, everyone. Whoa. There we go. Try that again. Well, good evening, everyone. God bless you. So glad that you're here tonight. Uh, you want to go ahead and open up your Bibles to Psalm 89. Rich will be up here in just a few moments to uh, lead us in that psalm and open up in prayer. But I thought, again, I would come up here and just share a scripture with you. Uh, a couple of things. One, I'm fully aware of what's happening in our nation's capital today, fully aware of what's been going on in our nation. It's very, very sad. I shared just with someone just a few moments ago, what we need to do is just keep our eye on the finish line. Uh, we are going home soon, and I'm looking forward to that day. But also, I want to come up here and just, uh, you, most of you may know it, but maybe you don't, that Sam Armstrong was in a uh, motorcycle accident last night, and he passed, and he's with the Lord. It's very hard to lose anybody, but especially someone you know very, very well. And Sam it was very evident that he loved the Lord, and he loved people. He had such a sweet, he has such a sweet disposition, and it's hard to lose people like that. And it's, when it's sudden and also tragic. It's very, very hard. So with that in mind, uh, and we'll get, we're going to meet with the family tomorrow, and we'll get the details of the memorial service so you can be a part of that, because I know that Sam's touched many of your lives. It's never easy uh, when a, a beloved member of the family passes. But Jesus said this, not just in regard to someone that passes, but just to our life in general. He said, let not your heart be troubled. Don't let it be agitated. Don't be overwhelmed. Didn't say don't be sad. Uh, sadness is a part of something that God gives us to help us work through things. It's okay to be sad. Um, but you don't have to be agitated or overwhelmed. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, that you may be also. So what the scripture teaches us is that the Lord's preparing a place for us. And whether we pass by death or the rapture, that the moment we close our eyes in this life, we are immediately with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And especially through an accident, that's a horrible thing to think about. But the thing is, is once, and death for anybody, but especially for the believers, just the separation of the consciousness from the body, that Sam was immediately escorted to heaven, where there's a great celebration for the work that he did here on earth. And he is in the glorious presence of our Lord. And it's something that's for all of us. So we're sad tonight, but we're not uh, hopeless. We know that Jesus is preparing a place for us. We know that he's coming very soon and that where he is, we will be also. Amen? amen. So, amen. God bless you guys. All right. Good evening, church. Good evening. I, uh, I opened this up last week and kind of gave you a background a little bit on, on Psalm 89, and we did the opening 18 verses. We're doing the middle section tonight, verses 19 through 37, and this is what's termed as the terms of the covenant. In these verses, a list of promises is made by the Father to Christ, indicating the terms of the covenant between the Lord and his people in the Redeemer. So Psalm 89, verses 19 through 37. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David, with my holy oil I have anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, also my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him and in my name his horn shall be exalted. Also I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My mercy I will keep for him forever, and my covenant 
shall stand firm with him. His seed also I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his sons forsake my law and do not work, walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgressions with a rod and their iniquities with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from him, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out from my lips. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. Selah. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what a powerful and wonderful promise you have given us. A, a promise to always be here for us. A promise to strengthen us and protect us from the wickedness of this world. During these difficult times, Lord, we need to remember that your loving kindness will not be taken from us. And we have your covenant and that it will not be broken. Lord, as we raise your name in praise and worship, bless all who are hearing of your word tonight, that it may bring us closer to you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. If you want to, let's stand to our feet. Let's worship him tonight. Put those hands together with us. Your love is amazing, steady and unchanging. Your love is a mountain firm beneath my feet. Your love is a mystery, how you gently lift me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, your love makes me sing. Your love is surprising, I can feel it rising. All the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through. I can feel this God song rising up in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, let's sing that second verse again. Your love is surprising, I can feel it rising. All the joy that's growing deep inside of me. Every time I see you, all your goodness shines through. I can feel this God song rising up in me. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your love makes me sing. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, tell him one more time. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, your love makes me sing, oh hallelujah, 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 your love makes me sing, amen, hallelujah, oh keep those hands together, this one's an oldie but a goodie. I wandered so aimless, life filled with sin. I would not let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more in darkness, no more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Oh yeah. And just like a blind man, I wandered alone. 
worries and fears I claim for my own. Then like a blind man that God gave back his sight, singing now, praise the Lord. I saw the light. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more in darkness. No more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. And I was a fool to wander astray. Straight is the gate and narrow the way. Now I have traded wrong for the right. Let me hear you. Praise the Lord. Oh, let's sing it to him now. I saw the light. I saw the light. No more in darkness. No more in night. Now I'm so happy. No sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord. I saw the light. Oh, I saw the light. I saw the light. No more in darkness. No more in night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow in sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Amen. Oh yes, thank you Lord that you have shown us the light because you're the way, you're the truth, and you're the life. There's no one like you. So we sing this to you, Lord. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe you are my fortress. You are my portion. You are my hiding place. I believe you are the way, the truth, the lie. I believe you are the way, the truth, the light. I believe through every blessing. Through every promise, through every breath I take, I believe that you are provider, and you are protector, you are the one I love, I believe you are the way, the truth. The light, I believe you are the way, the truth, the light, I believe. And it's a new horizon, and I'm set on you. And you meet me here today with mercies that are new and all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way the truth the light I believe are the way, the truth, the light, I believe you are. You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. Lord, to give up I'd be a fool. 
You are my all in all. Let's sing Jesus now. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name. Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name taking my sin my cross my shame rising again i bless your name you are my all in all when i fall down you pick me up when i am dry you fill my cup you are my all in all, yes, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name, Jesus, Lamb of God, worthy is your name worthy is your name worthy is your name worthy is your name you were the word in the beginning one with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. Jesus Christ, my King, what a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus, you didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. Jesus Christ, my King, oh, what a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus, what a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus, and death could not hold you. The veil torn before you, you silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. And you have no rival, you have no equal. God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, and yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ my king oh what a powerful name it is oh nothing can stand against 
What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Oh, yes, give him a hand of praise. What a wonderful name. You may be seated at this time. Once again, we're so glad you're with us this Wednesday evening, this cold Wednesday evening in mid-Florida. A couple of quick announcements for you. Yesterday, we just got in the current issue of our Calvary Chapel magazine. I read a couple of the articles today, just some beautiful articles. One, uh, a, an article called Strong in the Faith by Pastor Chuck Smith from uh, years ago. One of his teachings was just an awesome encouragement, just a couple of page article. And then also there's a great article in here about Calvary Cha Chapel, Old Bridge, New Jersey. They're doing a great work um, with ultrasound and pregnancy testing vans that they take out into the community. And they have saved so, many's ba so many baby lives from abortion because the mothers see that ultrasound of that baby and it's all a free ministry. And they've, there's several pages on it, a great write-up. So I encourage you, there's several of our Calvary Chapel magazines back there. They'll be over in the lobby on Sunday. So uh, for a donation of any amount to the mission ministry, it'll be well worth it. Some great encouraging articles about the Calvary Chapel movement. A couple other quick announcements for you. I want to remind you, every Thursday from 11 to 1, we have what's called Super on right here in this room. We have a, a feeding for the community, but it's also open to all the, all the people that call Calvary Chapel home. So if you uh, have some time tomorrow, you're looking for a great meal at a great price and some fellowship, and maybe you can come and minister to some people who uh, need Jesus, come on down 11 o'clock right here and uh, soups on Thursdays, every Thursday at 11 couple other quick things. want to remind you, the last Sunday of this month, it's our fifth Sunday fellowship at 5 o'clock right in the fellowship hall right behind me. And uh, that evening, we're going to have a fellowship meal uh, at the end, a time of communion. But also, our family ministry group is hosting a chili cook-off. So we need people to sign up uh, for the chili cook-off. See John Spencer on Sunday to sign up for that. It's going to be a great time, and we're just asking you to bring out some uh, food to share with everybody. We're going to have a great time, fellowship, and uh, a beautiful time together. Uh, then at the end, partaking of communion as a family. So that's, again, the last Sunday of this month at 5 o'clock. And then last but not least, want to remind you, ladies, we have a new item on the calendar for you all. Saturday, February the 13th at 11 a.m., the ladies are having a brunch uh, down at the Little House. And so that's to, to my right and to your left, all the way down the other end of the campus, the Little House. So come on out for a time of fellowship and encouragement and, of course, some great food. They're going to have really good food for you. If you want more information, of course, you can call the office, see Brenda Reed or see... Uh, Pastor Kevin's wife, Ruth Ballard, and they'll give you more information. Well, it's time to receive our Wednesday evening tithes and offerings. We have Ken, raise your hand there, and Steve, I believe it is. They have our offering um, baskets tonight. So we're going to pray and ask the Lord's blessing. Then we're going to get right into the word with Pastor Kevin after we receive our offering. And we believe our offering is just an extension of what we've been doing here already of worshiping and honoring God. So they'll be around if you uh, would like to give. Also, we do have an agape box right over there by the uh, entrance there if you want to uh, give unto the Lord that way. So let's ask the Lord's blessing. We'll give and get right into his word tonight. Father, thank you for this time that we've had to come together. Thank you that your house is a sanctuary, a haven of rest from the things of this world where we can come in and we can meet with you and we can be encouraged. And Lord, we've done that tonight. We've been encouraged as we've, as we've lifted up our, our voices to you in song. We've been encouraged as we heard the psalm read uh, at the beginning of our service. And Lord, we're thank you, we thank you in advance. We're going to be encouraged by your word uh, tonight. And we're going to leave here, Father God, strengthened for the days ahead. And now as we give to you, we give cheerfully and liberally. Thank you for every good gift you've given to us. Receive our offerings now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Give unto the Lord, and then we'll be in God's word in just a couple minutes.
right, guys, we, let's open our Bibles together to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, as we continue through this uh, action-packed book of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. So Acts chapter 11. You know what I did tonight? I don't mean to do this, but every once in a while, I forget that I have my phone in my pocket. I, I try to leave it on my desk, but I have it on my pocket. And so you know what I had to do? I had to pull it out of my pocket and put airplane mode on. And so that might be a reminder for some of you to put airplane mode on and turn it off, and that way you can slip it right back in the pocket, and it won't disturb us as we go to God's Word. So uh, learn from my mistake. Let's, let's offer this Bible study to the Lord. Father, we love you, and we just thank you uh, for the opportunity to be in this building, with <laughs> all that's going on in the world, the chaos, Lord. This is a refuge. You call your house when you meet, where you meet with your people, a sanctuary, a refuge, a place to literally relax and rest in the truth of what you share with us. And Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, as we go through this chapter, we thank you for the truth that we're reminded of that there are things that these men and women did because they were compelled by your spirit. And Lord, we want to be those type of people. We want to be a church that what we do is because we've been compelled by your spirit to do so. And Lord, knowing that when we do that, we will see fruitful uh, things take place. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and a mind to understand what you, the spirit, would say to us, the church. Give us a heart to receive this gospel. It is glorious and it has and continues to transform us from the inside out. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is literally the centerpiece for all the book of Acts. You know it well by now. It's the words of Jesus before he ascended to his father. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me. So the word power is dunamis. It means explosive, miraculous power that we are endowed with or we are clothed with or has been granted to us that we might... Uh, Use it to be a witness to him, that our life becomes a witness of the power of Jesus Christ to transform a sinner into a saint. And so that's all throughout this book. And what we have here are four groups of people in Acts chapter 11 that what they did, they did because they were compelled by the Spirit. Some of the things they did were not natural to them. It's not something they looked to go and do. It's not that it was weird or it was something that was sinful. It's just something that in their own person they would not naturally do. But the Holy Spirit, which lives inside of them and lives inside of us and empowers us, there's things that he's going to call us to do. There's things that he is going to anoint us to do. There's things that he is going to send us to do. And then finally, there's going to be things that he guides us to do. So what do I mean by that? Well, Jesus tells us that he calls us into relationship with him. And then he gives us his Holy Spirit. He anoints us for the task. He marks our life. He empowers our life and clothes our life with the power of his spirit. And then he sends us. He sends us out into a world, a world that is literally enveloped in darkness. And the closer we come to the return of Jesus, the more darkness will seem to prevail. But do not be deceived, my friends. Darkness will never, ever overcome the church, and it will never prevail. It only seemed that way. But he sends us out there. And then we can trust him to guide us. What I mean by that, he guides our feet on where we go. He guides our hands on what he wants us to do. And he literally guides our tongue on what we should say and sometimes when we shouldn't say something. And that's for all of us as believers. And we have that again in these four groups of people. They were compelled by the Spirit, called by the Lord, anointed by the Lord, sent by the Lord, and guided by the Lord. And when all said and done, either by rapture or death, when we follow the Lord like this, he, when we go stand before him, he will applaud us. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, and then he'll welcome us into the joy of our Lord, the joy of our salvation. What a day that is going to be. So it says here, the first part we have, literally the first 18 verses, is the ministry of Peter. Peter is going to explain why he felt compelled to go into a Gentile's house, have dinner with them, and actually spend the night with them, which according to their tradition was forbidden. And so it says here in verse 1, Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea, 
heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God, that someone had shared the gospel with them. We know him as Cornelius and all of his household. It's the first time that literally that the gospel was shared with a non-Jewish group of people. Now, uh, Peter and uh, John had been in Samaria. They were there with Philip, but the Samaritans were still uh, Jewish. This is the first time that Gentiles actually heard the gospel, and the news reached all the way from the port city of Caesarea all the way to the city of Jerusalem. And it says here, And when Peter had come up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him. The word contended means there was a heated debate. There was a hot confrontation. And I don't believe it was the apostles because the Holy Spirit tells us it was with the circumcision. Probably the Judaizers or the Pharisees who had come to faith in Jesus, they still taught and they still believed that it's faith in Jesus Christ plus circumcision. Faith in Jesus Christ plus following the dietary laws of Leviticus. You know, following the commandments that God gave Moses to give to the children of Israel. And we have to be aware of that today because there are always people who come along and say, and there's, look, there's churches like this in our community. There are people like this. There are family members you have that are like this, good buddies that you work with that are like this. They are Christians, but they always want to add something to faith. It's hard for us as people in the natural man to accept that we're saved by the grace of God and faith in Jesus Christ. You know what grace means? Undeserved, unmerited favor. And so those are the uncircumcision saying, hey, Pete, we want to know what's going on. Okay, it's one thing to preach to a Gentile, but did you tell them they had to be circumcised? Did you tell them they had to be uh, converted to Judaism? Then they could become a Christian? That's ex exactly what they were really preaching. There were steps. There were steps you had to take before you placed your faith in Jesus. And aren't you glad we didn't have to do that? I was at a friend's church one time here in our community. I won't tell you who it is. And, and after going through all the rituals and traditions and the standing, the kneeling, the standing, the kneeling, I said, man, your, your church wears me out. I could, I could never do this. And so and that's what some people tried to do. They try to wear you out with the things that you have to do to be saved. And so it said, Peter came up to Jerusalem. Those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. Otherwise, you did what you were not supposed to do. You know, Jesus warned us of this. It's a stumbling block to all of us, or it can be a stumbling block, where the word of God, what is taught, and our traditions collide with one another. You know what your traditions are. It's your worldview. It's how you were brought up. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with traditions, but Jesus warns to not allow traditions to supersede his word. The traditions are not to be equivalent with the word of God. And boy, it's so easy to fall in that trap. You know, how we think church should be done, how we think someone comes to Christ, what a true Christian looks like. And there's this tension in all of us. Listen, none of us are exempt from this. There's this tension in all of us with how we've been brought up, and for some, not everybody, on what type of church we went to and now what is being said. And that's what's happening with Peter. But Peter explained it to them in order. That word order is the same word that Luke used when he was writing his gospel. The gospel, according to Luke, to Theopolis, it was, it was very um, detailed. It was an orderly, systematic account of the life and ministry of Jesus. And what I see the Holy Spirit doing here is that Peter is patient with these guys. These are men that he loves. These are men that he has grown up with and come to faith in Jesus with. And so he is being very, very patient. And there's another stumbling block for all of us. Sometimes it's very, very easy in a family dispute to become impatient with one another. And don't think, listen, that's as important to the Holy Spirit as us reaching those who don't know Jesus. He wants us to be at peace with one another. It's not that we uh, let the elephant stay in the room and we want to talk about it, but when we do it, we do it you know, orderly, systematically. We explain you know, what is going on, and we communicate to one another, and we don't become impatient with one another. And none of that can be done in the natural man. You might do it for a little while, but we all have our limit, and after a while, we just, that's it, I'm done. You know, but the Holy Spirit is compelling, people, uh, compelling Peter, I believe. And he says he explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying. So, you know, he's doing what they've all been taught to do, to pray. And in a trance, I saw a vision. So he's caught up in the Spirit. 
It's something divine that's happened to them. And a vision is simply seeing something. It's like a dream, but you're awake. And it said, An object descending like a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me when I observed it intently and considered. I think it's something interesting. We, you know, Some people say, well, visions are not today. Dreams are not today. Prophetic words are not today. You know, healings and miracles are not today. And I think they're missing out on what God uses. God can use visions. He can use dreams. He can speak to us any way he wants to speak to us. But, it, but what's good for us to do is to do what Peter did. He observed it intently. Otherwise, he focused in and he considered. It means he molded around in that uh, Jewish noggin of his. You know, and he was thinking about that, contemplating that. And I think what Paul teaches us is that we are to take everything and compare it to what the Word of God says. You know, we don't take uh, our experience and say it's God. We take our experience and filter it through the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? That's why we get sometimes people in strange behavior. And they'll say, well, the Holy Spirit made me do this. Okay, uh, but I don't see that in the Word of God. So you're saying that if it's not in the Word of God, it, uh, it can't happen. What I'm saying is I won't even consider it because the Word of God's our absolute. It's, it's our anchor. It's our anchor. It tells us, it describes our behavior, it describes what we should and shouldn't be doing. But anyway, he considered it intently. So he didn't just blow it off and say, oh, man, that was some bad uh, you know, food last night. Um, I, 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 he just didn't throw it to the side. He said, I saw four animals on the, of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. Peter knew right away that this was the Lord Jesus speaking to him. How do I know that? Because in the following verse, in verse 8, he says, but not so, Lord. But I said, not so, Lord. So he knew Jesus. And this is dangerous ground. He knew it was Jesus speaking to him, but he still had the bravado. This is the old Peter coming out and says, basically, no, never, Lord. I would never, ever do this, Lord. And as we talked about last week, no and Lord do not go in the same sentence. They, they are mutually exclusive. They are the Hatfields and McCoys. You can't put no and Lord together because it's just an oxymoron. Because if he's Lord, then we are the servant, and it's always yes, yes, whatever you want. And so he says, not so, Lord. So he knew it was the Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. Now what brings me, it's kind of humorous, but also it reminds me that Peter was still in the process of being sanctified, set apart for God's noble purpose. And I believe the Holy Spirit intentionally wants us to know that, that all of us are in the process of being perfected. None of us have arrived. Even Paul, the great Paul the Apostle, says, I have not arrived. I have not been perfected. I'm still being, you know, still going through the process. And so, and he said, but one thing I do, I'm forgetting those things which are behind and going forward to the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. And I, the Holy Spirit wants us to know that he is still working on us. And I also like it because the Lord wants us to know he uses flawed vessels. Yeah. Isn't that beautiful? He doesn't use perfected vessels. He uses flawed vessels. And he is the master potter, and we are the pottery. We're the clay, and he molds us and shapes us and conforms us into his image. And when we get hard and sometimes brittle, he'll actually break us. Has everyone been breaking, broken by the Lord before? Oh, yeah. Sometimes I thought I would just changed my name to Jacob because I have this limp that the Lord had given me from the times I've resisted him. And so here it is, and just remind us that he uses flawed vessels and that none of us have arrived. And, and this is the great Peter, the apostle. But I said, not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice, verse 9, answered me again from heaven. It's showing the patience of God. He didn't erupt in anger and strike him down. You know, here Peter is actually saying, no, never, ever would I ever do this, Lord. It says that the voice answered me again from heaven, showing us the patience of the Lord with us. Sometimes as Christians, we get really bent out of shape because we know the Lord wants us to do something. He gives us a task, whatever that task may be, and we're slow in doing it which is disobedience, delayed obedience is disobedience. There's no other way to say it. Sometimes we just let that pass us by. You know one of the prayers I pray? And I think it's a good prayer. It's like, Lord, don't let me be so stubborn. 
Don't let me be so thick. Don't let me be so dull that I don't sense your spirit telling me to do something. I always want to remain pliable in the Lord's hands. I always want to be sensitive uh, to his leading. To be compelled by the spirit means that you're sensitive to the leading of the spirit on how he motivates you to do something. And, of course, that goes to the task of, you know, what am I feeding my mind with? What have I spending my time doing? Because those things, whatever we do, sometimes can hinder us from the, the sensitivity that we need to have for the Lord. And the answer again, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now, this was done three times. That was the Lord's way of saying, Peter, this is something that I want you to understand. Again, I love the Lord for that. And all were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, verse 11, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. This reminds us the Lord works on both ends. Remember, he spoke to Cornelius. Cornelius uh, sent men to go and fetch Peter, and Peter, the Lord's dealing with Peter, and now the two things are about to come together. It's remind us that we, the Lord always confirms his word to us. He always will. He'll confirm his word. Sometimes that word is confirmed after we take the step of faith. It's not a step of faith if you know what's going to happen, right? You know, in the book of Joshua, when the children of Israel is in Joshua chapter 3, when they were called, the, the priests were to lead the children to cross over the Jordan River. And the Holy Spirit had Joshua write that it was at flood stage. So when did, God, when did God part the Jordan? He didn't part the Jordan until the priests actually put their feet in the river itself. Here it is flooding over, and you can imagine the current that was happening. You can imagine the undertow that takes place. I can't think of anything spookier than just the overflowing river or tsunami. You know, so here they, but God didn't part it until they stooped, stepped into the river itself. And sometimes the Lord, he always will confirm his word, but also it requires a step of faith. How do I know that? It says here that at that very moment, three men stood before those. The house where I was having been sent to me from Caesarea, verse 12, and the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. There it is. That was the step of faith. This was huge. First of all, Peter was to have no contact, you know, interaction with a Gentile. And not only did he interact with this Gentile, but they walked together. I, I, again, I remember right, about 32 miles between Joppa and Caesarea. He actually walks with them, converses with them. This is a huge step of faith. And yet the Holy Spirit says, don't doubt anything. So how did he confirm it? He begins to walk, and it's going to be a little while before he confirms it. But it says, and he told us how he had seen, verse 13, an angel stand in his house and said to him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you, verse 14, words by which you and all your household will be saved. Remember, angels are messengers from God. They're not the preachers. An angel had appeared to Cornelius, but God, he could have used angels. And during the tribulation, he will use an angel. The revelation of Jesus Christ says there's an angel that flies to and fro throughout the world preaching the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. But here in the church age, he uses ordinary men and women who are in the process of being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, who are being perfected. Another word for perfected is matured. Another uh, word picture for perfected is actually a fisherman mending his net that has been torn, making it stronger so it doesn't break again. And so the Lord uses us. He could have used angels. The angel could have preached to Cornelius, but that's not God's assignment. His assignment was for Peter. And it says here, who will tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. And that's something for us to remember, that we are compelled by the Holy Spirit to be able to know how to share our faith. Remember, not only does he call you, but he anoints you. That means you can understand. You can understand it, and then he sends you, and then he guides you. And I'm not saying it's, a fearful, it's not a fearful thing, because it is sometimes. There are times that the Holy Spirit pricks your heart and says, I want you to share the gospel with them. It might be your spouse. It might be a family member. It might be a waiter or waitress in the restaurant where you're dining. It might be a buddy at work that you work with. But the Holy Spirit 
according to his discretion, says, here's what I want you to do. And my question to you is, are you prepared to do that? Remember, he's called you, he's anointed you, he has sent you, and he is guiding you. Any of us can learn how to do this. You, some of you have noticed uh, recent sermons on Sunday that I have been given what I call the ABCs. A, admit you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus is the Christ and the only way to be forgiven, the only way to heaven. And then C, call upon his name. That may not be the way you do it, but that's something I do. And I'll tell you exactly why. Because I felt impressed by the Holy Spirit with all that's happening in our world that we're coming to a conclusion. It's coming to a climactic end. You know, whether it's today or tomorrow, or even 10 years from now, it's coming to a conclusion. And, and I felt like the Holy Spirit saying, Kevin, there will be men and women that come through the doors of that sanctuary, some who have been attending for a while, and they're good people, they're moral people, but they're not born again. And I don't want to stand before the Lord and not hear him say, why didn't you give an opportunity for them to be saved? And then, see, there's also the opportunity for you. We should always be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Peter wasn't out looking to go door to door and hand out tracts. He was taking a nap, smelling the barbecue downstairs, waiting for lunch. And so, and then the Holy Spirit broke in, and thank God he was sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, you're talking about a hard choice. Barbecue or go to Caesarea on an empty stomach. Which do I do? You know, that's hard. Sometimes it's hard. You know, some, some of you like, ah, that's not a big deal. I can pass up barbecue. Well, I'm praying for you because I couldn't. So, you know, th there's this tension in our life. The tension over the leading of the Holy Spirit and our ordinary, sometimes mundane routine, which we all love because there's a sense of safety in that. But the, the, Peter gets up. There's also, and you guys can look this up for yourself, it's, it's called the Romans Road. It's a very, very simple way to explain, you know, why people need to be saved, how people can be saved. Just Google it sometime, the Romans Road. And it's the scriptures that are very, very easy to explain. There are a million things out there, and thank God for it because we're all different in our personalities. We're all different in how we learn and how we share with one another. But I could sum it up in this, what Paul told Timothy, let each of us be a workman rightly dividing the word of God, which means we're approved of God. Otherwise, to know, your, to know the Bible. And the Holy Spirit will take what you use and uh, share it with others. I'll, I'll give you a good example. I put it on Facebook today, a picture when we were in Israel of the Eastern Gate. Of the Eastern Gate. And uh, it's, it's kind of hilarious to me because there's all these graves of Muslims that are in front of the Eastern Gate because they sealed the gate because they knew the prophecies of Messiah walking through the Eastern Gate. So they sealed it. They said, that's not enough. We'll, we'll bury Muslims there because no Jew will uh, defile himself by come, you know, walking over the top of a grave. And they just don't understand the Lord at all, do they? Because the Bible says he'll step on the Mount of Olives, walk through the Kidron Valley, blow right past the graves. And if those people were born again, any of them, Muslim or Jew, whoever, they're born again, they're coming up out of the grave. And then he is going to bust through that eastern gate and go and sit on the throne of his father, David. So I put up uh, Psalm 24, and I put, perhaps today, open up ye gates, lift up your heads, for the God of glory is soon going to come in. And a buddy of mine, Eddie Panero, who is a Calvary pastor up in Pennsylvania, he was so excited. He said, I just read that in my devotion today. Isn't that cool? He said, well, you know, maybe the Lord had me put that on there, not only to encourage you, but just to confirm it in my friend's life in Pennsylvania. You know, to see, that's how the Lord works. He works through that. Uh, when I was uh, in Palm Beach for ministry for a long time ago, uh, there was this... Uh, Man, there he's an elder of a church down there, and I think he's still there. Phil's his name. He worked for the Palm Beach Post. And at the early, we had a men's meeting, a prayer meeting at six o'clock in the morning. I know. <laughs> uh, I was, I was on staff with another pastor. That's why I was there, because I wasn't even sure Jesus was awake at 6 in the morning. So I was there praying, and I felt like the Lord gave me a word that the Lord wants to give us all this day a Cornelius connection, thinking about the book of Acts. And so Phil called me later today and said, Pastor, I want to tell you something. I was on my job today, and he sold ads for the Palm Beach Post. And I was speaking to this vendor, and I said, look, send me, I'll give you the bill. Shows you this is before the Internet was in full swing. Uh, I'll mail you a bill. Where, what's your address? He said, well, I live on Cornelius Street. And come to find, and Phil says, you know what? That's what we were talking about today. And the other guy was a believer, and they just encouraged one another 
in the word. Just being sensitive to the spirit. Being sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so when you know the word of God, the written word, the Holy Spirit takes it and makes it a rhema word. A rhema word means it's the living word, the spoken word. It's the right word at the right time for a specific need. And isn't that beautiful how the Lord works? So whether you do it the ABCs or the Roman road, just know the word of God, have a devotional life, spend time with the Lord, and he'll cause that word that you've read that morning or that afternoon or that evening or the week before, and it'll come to life and work in the life of somebody else. And, I be- and as I began to speak, verse 15, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. So there is the confirmation. Peter had to get up. He had to travel 32 miles. He had to have dinner. He preached the word, and now God confirmed it. We all take steps of faith, and it's one foot in front of the other. It's one act of faith after another. But if if we continue to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, doing what he compels us to do, oh, the fruit of the ministry that comes out of that. Oh, the beauty of what the Lord does because of our obedience to him. Then I remember the word of the Lord, verse 16. (coughs) How he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? Now he's explaining himself again to those of the circumcision. You know, who am I to resist the Holy Spirit? Who am I to say no to the Holy Spirit? Who am I to do what the Holy Spirit, not to do what the Holy Spirit wants me to do? And that really should be something all of us should say. Who am I to uh, stand against God and what he wants? And sometimes it's doing things that are not necessarily natural for us to do. Peter never woke up that morning and says, I think I'll go have barbecue with some Gentiles. Have some shrimp. Have a lobster roll, you know, maybe some clams. He never thought that whatsoever. But the Lord was working in Peter. He was uh, tearing down walls, those traditions that Peter had been raised with. And he, he's tearing them down. And as we know, when he left Cornelius' house, he went and stayed with Simon the Tanner. That was a man who made his living skinning dead animals and making leather out of them, which was forbidden for a Jew to do. And see how, the Lord, see how the Lord works in their life? And there's traditions that he wants to tear down in our life so that we can be a more useful vessel to him. I don't know what the things that we do, but sometimes our traditions, again, can resist the will of God because that's not how we see it. That's not our worldview. That's not how we've been brought up. But the Holy Spirit will always, listen, he will not ever cause you or compel you to do something against the word of God. Jesus said this, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. It may not be natural for you to do. It might be uncomfortable for you to do, but it's in all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. We can trust him. We can trust him. We can rely on him. We don't have to be scared of him. Verse 18, when they heard these things, they became silent. This is also a sign that the Holy Spirit's working And they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. The the fruit of what's come out of this, and this was the first inroad into the Gentile world. And what would end up setting up one of the great churches, missionary sending churches of the Gentile world, that is in Antioch. Now the second group of people, in verses 19 through 21, are actually those who were scattered by the persecution of Saul of Tarsus. Remember, Saul had this this wild rage. He was full of rage. He had a murdering spirit. He committed murder in the name of God. And it said in Acts chapter 8 that the saints there in Jerusalem were scattered basically to the four winds um, because of the persecution. But here's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever noticed that the Holy Spirit doesn't compel us to do something when everything is rosy, (laughs) when everything is going well? There are many times that in the midst of persecution is when the Holy Spirit compels us to do something for him. That's not very comfortable sounding, but it shows me that God's providential hand is in everything, even in our persecution. 
Even when the, the church of Jesus Christ is being mocked and ridiculed, and in this time chased down and murdered, that God's spirit is on the move. It says here in verse 19, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, which is to the north of Israel, and Cyprus, which is to the west, and to Antioch, <coughs> which is in modern-day Turkey today. It was in Syria at that time, but it's in modern-day eastern Turkey today, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, that is the Greeks, the Gentiles, preaching the Lord Jesus. You see the phrase there in verse 20, some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene. These are fellow Gentiles who had heard the gospel. Well, how did they hear the gospel? Because those who had been scattered by the persecution went to Cyprus. I'm sorry, these are Jews. who went to Cyprus, they heard the gospel, and then the Holy Spirit compelled them to leave Cyprus and Cyrene and go to Antioch and preach not to the Jews there, but to the Greeks or the Hellenists, which means Greek, Greek culture, the Gentiles. And they did this in the midst of persecution. Now, Antioch was the third largest city in the Roman Empire behind Rome itself and Alexandria of Egypt. It had a half a million people in it. A half a million. There was a thriving Jewish population in there of about 25,000 Jews. And the city of Antioch was divided up into barrios like New York City. You had the Syrian barrio, and you had the Greek barrio, and you had the Jewish barrio, and then the Roman barrio. They, and so they all lived, and they lived, and they ate, and they did business within their own people group. Well, these Jews leave Cyrus and Cy Cyprus and Cyrene and come into Antioch and began to reach the 475,000 non-Jewish people that lived there. And you think, with all those people there, this would be a piece of cake. But here's the problem. Antioch was a very dark, dark city spiritually. It had the temple of Diana in it and also the temple of Apollo and it was in the suburb of Daphne. Daphne was uh, a goddess that was considered very, very uh, lascivious. Uh, it, and so the Temple of Apollo and the Temple of Diana both had temple prostitutes. And so they, sexual immorality was involved with the pagan worship. And Antioch was considered basically in the, in the, like the, the seedy parts of New Orleans, except it was the whole city was like this. Bur it was, Bourbon Street was Antioch. Antioch was Bourbon Street. And so this is the, where they went. Have you ever noticed that the Lord always sends us into the, sometimes the darkest places? And he always sends us to people who have the thickest head. And who, who, some people, they just are, they're just always angry. They don't want to hear about God. They want nothing to do with God. And you have to ask yourself, well, if not me, then who? You know, and if not someone, then how are they going to get saved? And that's who the Lord compelled them to go to. And it says here that they come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. Now, what I like about this, they came to Antioch and dwelt there. What they did is they began to dwell among the people there in Antioch, these pagans, these horrible, horrible people. And they're much like the prophet Ezekiel who was told by God, and he said, I came to the captives, that is Ezekiel, because God told me to, who dwelt by the river, and I sat where they sat and remained there among them seven days. Otherwise, the Lord, when he compels us to go to someone, he wants us to be in relationship with them. He wants us to dwell among them. He wants us to try to understand where they're coming from, why they do the things they do. He wants us to come into a relationship with them to begin to break down the barriers where they can begin to trust us and hear what we have to say and give them the words of life. Again, not very, <laughs> it's not very comfortable to do that. There's some people when they talk, it's like, I can't be around this. I feel like I need to go take a bath. But so after a while, but the Holy Spirit says, no, I want you to, I, I, can, I want you still sown into their life. I want you to be in relationship with them. I don't want you to be influenced by them, but I want you to be an influence to them. And it says here, they did this. So this is a step of faith for them. They left their home. They came to an immoral city of debauchery, 
and they dwelt there. They'd gotten relationship with the people, but that's their step of faith. And then it says in verse 20, and the hand of the Lord was with them. This is the witness that God was with them. What was the witness? The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Think about that. Temple prostitutes turning to the Lord. Those who visited the temple prostitutes turning to the Lord. Those who participated in all kinds of debauchery turning to the Lord. Those who were involved in the illegal sex trade turning to the Lord. Alcoholics, drug addicts, you know, people of just that are low moral character turning to the Lord. How did this happen? It wasn't that there's something special about these men from Cyprus and Cyrene. They were simply obeying the guidance of the Holy Spirit. They were sensitive to the lead of the Holy Spirit, and it was the Lord who does this. That's something we need to remember. We don't do these things. The Lord does it. How do I know? And the hand of the Lord was with them. It's a physical description of trying to understand the power of God. In the book of Exodus, when Jambres and Janes came against Moses, they were the Egyptian prophets, there were the plagues, the ten plagues, which you know about. There was the first plague, the second plague, the third plague, but the fourth plague was the plague of lice. And the other three plagues, you know, the staff being turned into a serpent and then picking the serpent up, turned into a staff again, the water turning into blood, and I think the other one was frogs. They, they were able to replicate those things. Why would you replicate frogs? I don't understand that. But anyway, they were able to replicate those things, but they could not do the lice. The lice that covered the land of Egypt. And the two magicians came to Pharaoh and said this, this is the finger of God. This is something divine. This is something supernatural. This is something beyond our own power. And then they told him in Exodus chapter 10, do you not know that God has destroyed our nation? That's how powerful the finger of God is. It can destroy a nation. It can do what no human will ever be able to do. And yet we're told it's not the finger of God, it's the hand of God. Because the greatest miracle ever performed among people is not opening of blinded eyes or even the raising of the dead, it's the transformation of a wicked, sinful heart. Only God can do that. Only God can do it. It's the hand of the Lord was with him. And that's something we need to remember, that when we obey the Holy Spirit, whatever he calls us to do, the hand of the Lord is with us, and he'll do what no man could do. He'll do what you could never do. He'll, he'll do things beyond anything we can ever, ever understand. Jesus said this, he had cast out a demon out of a man, uh, and they questioned him and said that he was a Beelzebub, that he was actually a part of the prince of darkness, that he did this. And he said, if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. And that's what Jesus does. When we go out and share the gospel, when the Lord compels us to do so, his hand is with us. And what he does is he overwhelms, he overtakes the adversary of our soul, Satan himself, who holds people in bondage. That Jesus is able to break the chains and open the eyes and open the ears and soften the heart and open the mind to understand what you're sharing with him. You don't have to have a PhD or a THD, a MA or MS or BA or BS. You don't have to have any of those things. All you need to do is be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He calls you, he anoints you, he sends you, you, he guides you. And when you follow his guidance, the hand of the Lord is with you. Amen. Has nothing to do with education, has nothing to do with you're an introvert or an extrovert, has nothing to do with you being a Christian 20 years or two days. The hand of the Lord is with you, my brothers and sisters. Paul said it this way, if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age have blinded. So what do you do? The reason people are in sin is they've been blinded by the God of this age. He said, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. The way to see spiritual eyes are open is to preach and to live Jesus. 
That's how you do it. You live for Jesus. You preach Jesus. He said, it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Isn't that beautiful? So here they come into this wicked, depraved city full of all kinds of immorality, things that we would be too embarrassed to talk about in mixed company, much less among believers. And they go in and the light has shone in the darkness. Light dispels the darkness. And men and women who have been in bondage for a decade, two decades, three decades, however long it's been, their whole entire life, all of a sudden have been set free because someone dared to obey the Holy Spirit and go and share Jesus with those who do not know Jesus. Amen? How beautiful that is. Now, the third group is Barnabas and Saul. Now, we know Saul has now become a believer. He's been gone for 10 years. He's in the Arabian desert and now has returned back to Tarsus uh, in Turkey, going back, uh, making tents. And so he's been there. He's been gone 10 years. And it says here in verse 22, then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. So they've heard again now more Gentiles being saved, not just one household, an entire city being turned upside down. I want the Lord to say that about us. When we get to heaven, by rapture, that's what I'm believing in, but if by death, by rapture, he says, that's the group of people that turn Citrus County upside down. Because he, and I believe this, he, he'll brag on us, he'll applaud us, he'll, he'll share how pleased he is with us, and actually have us share the stories of what he's done through us. I believe the Bible teaches that, and that's what I long for. And you know, listen, we want, we want to please the Lord. We love him, but could you imagine him bragging about you? I believe the book of Ephesians implies that as the trophies of his grace. He brags on us and applauds us, and right now through the Holy Spirit urges us on. And so they heard about this entire city being turned upside down. I hope that's what the Lord says about us. That's what I'm striving for. Let's, let's don't leave Inverness the same or Floral City the same or Crystal River the same. Let us turn this upside down for Jesus and let the Lord do what he wants to do. And if we'll just be sensitive to the leading of his spirit, the hand of the Lord will be with us. They sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. It's amazing. They chose Barnabas because he was known as an encourager. That's so important, especially for new believers. That encouragers come alongside of them. That's what the word encouragement means. To stand alongside of. To instruct. To encourage. To exhort. And sometimes challenge. And every new believer needs that. And so the Holy Spirit knew whom he needed in Antioch. So he pressed upon the apostles, I want you to send Barnabas. Again, the providential hand of God involved. They, they, it was a natural selection for the apostles, but I believe the Holy Spirit was all over this. I want you to send Barnabas. You couldn't send James, the brother of Jesus. He's still too much of a Jew. It was very hard. James had a long way to go before he came to the realization that you're saved by faith. And so he couldn't send James. He didn't send all the, any of the other apostles. He sent Barnabas, who was not an apostle. He was simply an encourager. He was from the tribe of Levi. And so they sent him. And when he came, he had seen the grace of God. He was glad, and here it is, encourage them all. You may not be able to do anything else. You may think, I, don't have I can't do this, I can't do this, I can do this. But here's one thing that the Lord has anointed all of us to do is encourage. Yeah. Encourage, to be an encourager. And listen, you're either doing one or two things, my friend. You're either encouraging people or discouraging people. We've got enough discouragers running around. We need encouragers. Amen. we got enough people who are calling, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. We need people to, who say, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. Lift up your head for your redemption draws nigh. And we can do this under the power and unction of the Holy Spirit. And he encouraged them all with purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord. You guys remember what it was like when you were infant Christians? You, you know, you're falling down, you're stumbling, you, you didn't know what you were doing, and you had a pastor or you had a, a, a spouse or a friend who walked with you, discipled you, encouraged you to continue with the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. 
That's all it takes to be an encourager. A good man means he's morally upright. He's walking his faith. He was a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ through how he lived, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. He believed God for great things. And a great many people were added to the Lord. He was sent there to encourage the Christians. And by encouraging, more and more people were coming to faith. Again, salvations of the Lord. It's always funny that churches will spend thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of dollars. We haven't done it here. And they'll bring in church growth experts. I know churches that have done that. And what does it change? Nothing. Except they're broke. <laughs> they're broke. Because the Lord does it. The Lord does it. Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. The Holy Spirit reminded Barnabas. Barnabas was the one who introduced Saul to the church in Jerusalem because they were scared to death of Saul. And even though Saul had been gone 10 years, <coughs> Barnabas didn't forget him. But I believe the Holy Spirit whispered in Barnabas' ear and says, I want you to get Saul. It's now time for Saul. I want you to go and get him. Saul's his Hebrew name. His Greek name is Paul. We know him as Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle, before he was Paul the Apostle, it began with the Holy Spirit compelling Barnabas to leave the work in Antioch and go over to uh, Tarsus and to find Saul. Now, there was no email, of course, and there were no automobiles, of course. Uh, I don't know how, I can't remember how far the two cities are from each other, but it is implied it took Barnabas quite a while to find him, to track him down. I've read some commentators believe it took up to a year to find him. I don't know about that, but at least it took weeks, maybe months. And, you know, that's another thing that reminds me when the Holy Spirit tells us to do something, we should continue doing it until he tells us something different. You ever thought about that? Do what God calls you to do and tells you to do something different. We have such a tendency, well, nothing's happening, I quit. Well, well, if God told you to quit, you quit. But if God doesn't tell you to quit, you keep going. That's what you do. You keep going until the Lord says different. So are you ever going to retire, pastor? If the Lord says yes, otherwise I keep being a pastor. That's what happens. Because I'll tell you who wants me to keep pastoring is my wife. Because she knows if I retire, I'll still keep preaching, and she'll be my only congregation, and she, she can only get saved so many times. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we all have pastor family in our family or friends, and you find out, man, the pastor's out. I have to preach to someone. And so that they, she wants me to keep going. And when he found him, verse 26, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. It shows us the great need of a new Christian. Preaching is what brings people to faith in Jesus Christ. But teaching is what helps us develop in Christ. And they're the two legs of the same stool. We need both. Preaching and teaching. And so they came and they began to teach the people for a year. They began to disciple them, to instruct them in the things of righteousness. The whole, all the Bible is used for, useful for instruction. That's what Paul told Timothy. But specifically the New Testament on daily living, on the, the gift of faith that God gives us, the assignments that he has for us. You know, Paul said this to the Ephesians, It was God who gave some to be pastors and teachers. For what? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's why we come together to receive instruction. And that's what Paul, that was, uh, Paul and Barnabas, or Saul at this time, Barnabas were doing. And, and it says, they assembled the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Christ followers, little Christ, that's what they were called. It was a derogatory term, by the way. But don't you love the way the Lord takes something derogatory and makes it something beautiful? And, uh, you know, some people don't want to use the word Christian today because the world has made it something it's not supposed to be, but it's in the Bible, so I have no problem with it. You can call me a Christian, I understand what that means. It means I'm a follower of Christ. It means I'm trying, I imitate Christ. It means I am, you know, trying to do everything that Christ does. And so don't be afraid of that word. Don't be afraid of the word born again. Don't be afraid of the words Christian. Don't be afraid of the word baptized in the Holy Spirit or baptized with the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid of the gift of speaking in tongues. Don't be afraid of the gift of prophecy because it's all from the Lord. And that's what they are. And so, uh, and I know the world distorts it and uses it and they take parts of the Bible and they mock it and ridicule it. And, 
but that's okay. That's, that's them. We're just doing our job. We're just following the Lord, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and not being ashamed of any of it. And so here it is. It says the last group here is a group of prophets. A group of prophets show up to Antioch. Prophets are twofold. They're, one, they are foretelling the future. And that's what's going to happen here. And others are foretelling, otherwise saying this is the will of God. And so there are a group of prophets. And it says in these days, prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. And then one of them named Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. And so Caesar Claudius was on the throne, and I love what the Holy Spirit does. Here you have a man who has the gift of prophecy. And what is the gift of prophecy supposed to do? Well, Paul said this, He who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. That's how you judge prophecy. Even when it's a stern word, it is to do what? It is to edify, it is to exhort, and it is to comfort. Reminds me of what we've been doing on Sunday mornings. We're going through the last days and what our role is, and we are to be a watchman. Well, watchmen is the same as having someone who has a gift of prophecy. We are to see what's on the horizon, and we've been given the word of God to tell us the signs of the times. We sound the alarm, and then we instruct people what they need to do. It's one thing to see what's coming. It's another thing to actually sound the alarm, but we shouldn't stop there. We then instruct, here's what you need to do. What must I do to be saved? That's what the jailer said uh, to Paul and Silas after the earthquake. An angel appeared, opens the prison doors, the chains come off, and he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And that, they instructed him on what to do. So that's what this prophet's going to do. And we're told uh, Josephus and Tacitus, who was a Roman historian, Josephus, a Jewish historian, actually gave the details of the famine that would take place during this, that would take place shortly after um, this prophecy. Now, there were four famines that took place during the time of Claudius. And I just want to read this just for a second so you'll understand that Josephus says, in the fourth year of his reign, there was a famine that continued for several years, greatly affecting the land of Judea. And Queen Helena, Helena, of Rome sent some servants to Alexandria of Egypt to buy great quantities of corn and other servants to Cyprus to bring back dried figs, which he distributed to the people in Jerusalem. So that could have been the famine they were talking about. The Roman, uh, Tacius, the Roman historian said a fourth famine, which took place in Claudius' 11th year, was so great that it seemed to be a divine judgment, and the storehouses of Rome contained more than 15 days' provision. So I tend to think that's what the one that he was talking about because they had no provision for the famine, meeting the needs. And so he stands up and warns what's going to happen. And look, then the instruction comes in verse 29. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. So they, here's what's coming on the horizon. The alarm sounded, now they have the instruction of what they must do. And the Lord can use you that way. You say, here's what's coming. Listen, we live in the greatest day in human history. We are on the verge. We're in the shadow of the coming of Jesus Christ to rule and reign here on the earth. And people, Christian or not, they know something's up. Because, I don't know about the rest of the world, but our nation's definitely gone mad. It's just insane. And the world's dealing with covid and the political intrigue and corruption all across the globe. The economy is tanking in many places. And immorality, the whole world spiraling immorality. And it's just getting out of control. And, they, and you have people that the Lord will send to you say, do you know what's going on? I know you, you go to church. Do, do you have any idea what's going on? And you, you, you look for what's happening. And then you sound the alarm, and then you instruct them. That's what's going on here. The disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief. Notice that they gave according to what they had, not what they did not have. I like that. To send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. This they also did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So they got together and said, here's what we're going to do. Anybody who has something, would you give? And then we'll take the collection, and we will send it to Jerusalem to provide relief to the brothers and the sisters that are dwelling there. 
And uh, what a beautiful gift that is. But something I noticed too. Who did they send it by? Barnabas and Saul. This is their first ministry trip together. And it would lead to huge, huge things. They would, and we'll see this in chapter 13, they were able to see an entire island turned upside down for the Lord. And it just reminds me, the Lord always starts with small things, and it always leads to greater things. And so don't ever just overlook it or think it's not a big deal what you're doing for the Lord. The Lord has in mind exactly what he's doing, and he wants you to do it because one thing leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to another. Who knows what the Lord will do? Amen? Father, we love you, and we just thank you for this night. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who has called us, who has anointed us, who sends us and guides us, Lord. And what our prayer is as a people is that we want to be sensitive to your leading. We want to be able to say yes every time you guide us, especially to those things that we're not familiar with or may not be comfortable with. But we know as we take those steps of faith, you will always confirm your word. And we can always trust and know that we know that we know that the hand of the Lord is with us. Lord, we pray for our president. We pray for our nation. We pray for our state. We pray for our community. Lord, our ultimate prayer is that not only do you bring every one of these men and women to faith, but keep them safe in the job that you've given them, and come quickly, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.